Can folks hear me in the back? Yes. Okay, I won't use the mic. It's a little, little blurry. Um, we've been uh, uh, working at this uh, actually since uh, last fall, and uh, really pleased that all of you could be here today. I know it's sometimes uh, tough to get up early in the morning on uh, Monday morning and then come and listen to a bunch of folks speak. But in a few minutes, you're really going to have a tremendous opportunity to hear somebody who I think actually may change your lives in a little bit. And uh, I urge you to really try to listen carefully to our speaker from Oakland. Um, just a, a while ago, it was last fall, um, a number of us had an opportunity to hear him. And uh, it really changed my thoughts about what it might mean to go to school here in Manchester. I just I felt I learned something uh, from, from hearing this gentleman from Oakland. And so uh, we thought it might be good to bring him out here. And uh, so we're kind of talking about it, you know, but you know how things are. You know, you talk about it and then nothing really happens. And I happen to have a, uh, an intern who I'm going to introduce to you in a second, uh, Pedro Maldonado from uh, Southern New Hampshire University, uh, who's been through a, a few things in his life. And he's uh, in a program called College Unbound at Southern New Hampshire University. And I was telling him a little bit about Jeff. And uh, uh, next thing I know, he's uh, communicating with him, uh, emails and texts and other things. And uh, to make a long story short, he's uh, figured out the arrangements to, uh, to get him out here. And so uh, Jeff's going to, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Pedro's going to come up here and uh, introduce uh, uh, Jeff in a moment. But before I do that, I do also want to just acknowledge not just the leadership of the mayor and the superintendent and the, and the principal, really trying to improve things here and really make this, uh, this school and offerings in, uh, in uh, Manchester and MST just a little better for you as you go forward. But I also want to acknowledge uh, the Stupsky Foundation, which uh, we would not have been able to have this session today without uh, Donna Peduto over here, who's already been introduced, and Susan Colby, who actually put up the funds to uh, uh, bring our speaker out here and, and arrange uh, today's session. And Susan uh, uh, wanted me to share this with you. She just had a, a brief message. Um, the foundation stands with student leaders like you in our shared effort to change the way learning happens in our schools. We believe that students should own and drive their learning. Own and drive your learning to achieve your highest success in school and in life. To achieve this vision, our student ambassadors are at the table with teachers, principals, and policymakers in bringing change to their schools. We are inspired by you and by them. Our message to you is simple. You need to take your education. It's yours. You are the leaders of a learning revolution, and together we need to transform education to put you, the students, at the center so you can live the life of your dreams. I want to thank you for your leadership. And so we thank Susan for her, her leadership and her support and her real fervent belief in you as students and as future uh, citizens in this city and, and uh, in this country. Now with that, I'd like to introduce my uh, intern uh, from the, the, the last uh, year, Pedro Maldonado. Pedro uh, has been going to school at Southern New Hampshire University and working as an intern uh, up at the Department of Education, learning a lot about public education uh, all across the way. And uh, I'm going to ask him to come up and say a few words to introduce John. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <clears throat> Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. I welcome all to our student summit here at the Manchester School of Technology. <clears throat> My name is Pedro Maldonado and I'm currently a student of education at Southern New Hampshire University through a big picture learning program called College Unbound. You know, a few years ago, I never would have thought that I'd be in the position that I am now, standing in front of a large crowd of people and educational pioneers speaking the way that I'm speaking right now. Actually, a few years back, I was thinking more about joining gangs and selling drugs, basically giving in to becoming a product of my environment, until 
an opportunity to come to college literally walked right through the doors of a workforce development program that I was previously enrolled in after having dropped out of high school in 11th grade. I grabbed this opportunity and shook it until it decided to accept me. Although it wasn't an easy task to complete a college application process and meet deadlines because it was my first time, with the right support group I felt as though anything was possible. And judging by where I stand today, anything really is possible. The theme of today's event correlates well with the struggles that students like myself face on a daily basis, even today in the state of New Hampshire. Students are expected to meet criteria that might not necessarily be easy given their life situations. Some students might lack support from family to complete high school and receive their diploma, and other students might be caught up in a life of gangs and violence outside of their school and in their environment. It is our duty as educators to find ways to support these students, not just within schools, but outside of schools as well. As educators, it is our job to problem solve and generate techniques that will tackle these issues. It is our job to make it easier for students to both succeed in school and become lifelong learners. As some of you may know, I've been an intern for New Hampshire, for the New Hampshire State of Department of Education for the last two semesters. And while there, I've had an amazing experience alongside of Paul Leather, the Deputy Commissioner of Education. Earlier this year, Paul asked me if I'd be willing to take on a slightly larger project. This project was of vast interest to me because it gave me the opportunity to help do something about the educational experiences that I had when I was in high school, but on a much larger scale. This project would give me the opportunity to demonstrate to educators that we as students don't learn the same way or at the same pace. This project would allow me to speak on behalf of all the students that struggle in secondary education and in turn come up with ways to help this body of students graduate and become lifelong learners. In order to accomplish my goal of making this event something that would resonate with both educators and students, I connected with someone who fights the same battle in his own way. Paul introduced me to his name and what he does, and I immediately sent him an email letting him know who I was, where I'm from, and kept in contact with him. I admire the work that this educational entrepreneur does in Oakland, California, and I'm glad that we were able to get him out here and partake in this student summit. Jeff Duncan Andre is an Associate Professor of Razak Studies in Education Administration and Interdisciplinary Studies and Director of the Educational Equity Initiative at the Wangari Mathai Center for Sustainable Cities and Schools at San Francisco State University. Jeff also continues as a high school teacher in East Oakland where he practices critical pedagogy in urban schools. He currently directs the East Oakland Step to College program, where he personally teaches a group of students and helps them reach the almost unimaginative goal of making it to post-secondary schooling. Jeff has lectured around the world about the elements of effective teaching in schools, serving poor and working class children. He works closely with teachers, school site leaders, and school district officials, nationally as far abroad as Brazil and New Zealand, to help them develop classroom practices and school cultures that foster self-confidence esteem and academic success among all students. His research interests and publications span the areas of urban schooling and curriculum change, teacher development and retention, critical pedagogy, and cultural ethnic studies. He has articles published, he has articles and book chapters published in leading journals such as the Harvard Educational Review and Qualitative Studies in Education. Ladies and gentlemen, students, administrators, it is both an honor and a great pleasure to introduce to you Jeff Duncan Andrade. I'm going to use my teacher voice, so I'm not going to be on the mic. Um, greetings, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me out here. I want to start by just um, acknowledging um, my own community and the young people from my community. Um, they asked me to tell you thank you for bringing me out here because it means I'm not in class today, <laughs> which means they have a sub, so we don't know how that's going. Um, these are my students, they're, uh, they're 11th graders. How many 11th graders in here today? Okay, so, um, and how many seniors in here today? Right on, a lot of seniors, good. Okay, so um, a lot of what you're gonna hear today um, is sort of a combination of um, my own life experience, um, my experience uh, of the last 20 years being a teacher in my community in East Oakland, 
Um, and then um, about that same amount of time uh, of doing research on um, what works in schools, how it works, and why it works. And I want to start by um, just giving you kind of a little background on who's standing in front of you. So um, my people come from, from the Mexica and the Mayan. Um, and, and you probably will not have learned much about any of those groups in school, um, although you would have had at least uh, likely been partially miseducated um, about the Mexica. So how many of you have heard of the Mexica before? By show of hands. Okay, three people, right. Shocking. Um, so um, Mexica, um, the Mexica were the indigenous people of the northern region of what you would now know as, as Mexico, okay, or Mexico. And uh, Mexica is spelled M-E-X-I-C-A. Okay. And this is where you get the name of the country of Mexico. Okay. Mexico was named after my people. Um, they just changed the vowel. Um, but you would know the Mexica. How many of you have heard of the Aztecs before? Okay. There were no Aztecs. Um, these are what the Spaniards called us. Okay. So when the Spaniards came and they saw the Mexica people, they effectively renamed us as the Aztecs. Okay. So um, when you're learning in school about the Aztecs, you should correct the teachers um, and let them know that the proper name of that group of people was the Mexica. Okay? And in the southern uh, part of the continent, um, or, or that what you would know now as Mexico, was a group called the Mayans. Okay? And the Mayans um, had a principle that we used to teach all of our children. It's called in la Kesh. Okay? And in la Kesh literally means the smoking mirror. And it was, that was the core principle of our society when we raised children. And the idea was that if I'm looking at you, okay, if I'm looking at any human being, okay, any living thing, that I'm looking at a smoking mirror. Right? And if I'm looking at a smoking mirror, and I have the courage and the character and the integrity to clear the smoke away, what will I see? Okay, you will see yourself. And this was the principle with which we raised all of our children. The idea that anybody, right, so when I'm looking at you, I see myself. Okay? And for some of you, it's a little more smoke between us than, than with others. Right? But that's not the question. The question is whether or not I have the courage and the character and the integrity to take the time to clear the smoke to see myself. Now, these principles have been passed on, right, culture to culture to culture. So no matter what culture you come from, right, and many of us in this country don't know our indigenous culture, right, so we say that we're from the United States, right, the only people that are from the United States, right, are the people that are indigenous to North America, okay, so unless you trace your lineage to an indigenous tribe in North America, you're not from the United States, right, you're an immigrant to the United States, right, but as we lose track of that indigeneity, right? If you lose track of who you are, who your people are, who your original language is, right? Then someone else will tell you who you are. Someone else will tell you what your language is. Someone else will tell you what your culture is. And this is a quintessentially American phenomenon. Right? So I encourage everybody in here to figure out, right? Trace back who you really are. Right now, in the Mexica tradition, we say that everything that we do on a daily basis stretches seven generations, two directions. So everything we do on a daily basis is influenced by seven generations in the past. Most people in this country can't trace back much past their grandparents. Okay, some of you can get to your great-grandparents. Right? But in our tradition, you have to know seven generations back. Right? The Maori tradition in New Zealand, you have to know your first ancestor. Okay, so you can speak to Maori young people who can literally recite all the way. It takes them like a solid 30 minutes right, to tell you if you ask them, who are you, where do you come from? They'll recite all the way back to their first ancestor. But in the Mexica tradition, we also believe that what you do every day echoes seven generations forward. But this is not what school will teach you. This is not what this society will teach you. It will teach you that it's all about you. It's all about what you can do. Right? So in school, oftentimes, if you have the answer, 
to a question and she doesn't, and it's a test, what happens to him if he shares the answer? He gets, just trip on that for a second. Just, just let that register for you a second, right? Is, is this a community or not? Is this a community? I'm asking you real questions, okay? So if it's a community, right? And, I, and I'm hungry and she has food, isn't it her responsibility to share her food with me? If it's a community, okay? Real talk, right? It is her responsibility, right? But in school, you're taught the opposite. If he has answers and she doesn't, he's a cheater for helping her, right, with the answers. All under the auspices of this being like, you know, rigor, right? And we're gonna we're gonna see who who's deserving and who's not. Right? So these principles are taught to us through school, right? The ways in which we operate in society are largely taught to us through school, right? And this was often in conflict with me when I was growing up. I'm the youngest of seven kids, okay? And I grew up in the hip-hop generation, okay? And the hip-hop generation is different than the rap generation, right? Let's be clear about that. What, a lot of what y'all are getting access to, okay, is not hip-hop, it's rap. Okay. So, and it, well, here's the difference, right? Rap, okay, is the, 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 the acquisition of the culture of hip-hop by corporate America, okay? and then the remarketing of that back to you okay? under the guise of hip-hop. Right? But hip-hop, the generation I grew up in, was defined by how many of y'all know who Chuck D is? Okay, a few hip-hop heads in here. All right, Chuck D, right, was, was, is the MC of Public Enemy. Okay? And he said hip-hop is CNN for black, brown, and poor people. And the reason he said that is, is because hip hop would report on things, would tell stories that CNN wouldn't tell. They would talk about things that were going on in our communities, right, that other people wouldn't talk about. Or, or that CNN might report on it, but they'd report on it from a very different perspective, right? Now, of all the folks that influenced me in hip hop, and there was a lot of them, the one that probably most profoundly Im impacted me was Tupac. And the reason that Pac most impacted me, the reason Pac most spoke to me, was for two reasons. One, because Pac talked about unconditional love. Okay. And as a young person growing up, right, in and out of the streets, right, in and out of lockup, in and out of school, right. It wasn't a lot of people who had love for me, right? except for my closest people, specifically my family, right? unconditionally loved me. And some of y'all may have that same experience. Right? You've got a lot of people around you that are supposed to have love for you, but you may not feel that love. But there's a few people who you know, no matter what you do, no matter what your get down is, they're going to love you anyway. And so Pac very much spoke to me when he talked about the idea of unconditional love. The other thing that Pac really spoke to me about was this metaphor he used of the rose that grows from concrete. Okay. Y'all heard that before? Okay. And Pac talks about, he, he says, when you see a rose growing in the concrete, you don't question its damaged petals. Of course it has damaged petals. It grew in the concrete, fool. <laughs> Instead, you celebrate its tenacity and its will to reach the sun. So to every educator in the room, okay. I challenge you that when you see a young pe person, okay, when you see me, you have a choice about whether or not you see us for our damaged petals. And I have damaged petals. I wear them in ink on my arms. So that every morning when I wake up and I get out the shower and I look in the mirror, right, I remember who I am. Okay. And I know where I came from. But the problem with school for me was, is that every time I walked to the school door, the school expected me to leave that ink at the door. That's why I appreciate you, brother. I remember you, because you opened a door for me this morning. Okay? You didn't know who I was. Right? You knew I was the keynote speaker. Right? I was just some dude walking in, and you just held the door for me. Right? And so I appreciate you for that, because you saw me not for my damaged pedals, right? but you saw me right, as your brother right, in La Keche. 
So to the educators in the room, right, every young person you work with, right, has damaged pedals. And every young person you work with has the tenacity and the will to reach the sun. You choose which one you see. But why I appreciate Pac so much is because how absurd is it to look at a rose growing in the concrete and then to question its damaged petals? I was the rose that grew in concrete. And when they see me growing in the concrete, what do you do if you see a rose growing in the concrete? You plug somebody said kick it. Don't kick it. Right? <laughs> Don't kick the rose. <laughs> you, you, you pluck it. Okay? So they plucked me up out the concrete, right? And they took me over to the rose garden known as UC Berkeley. They dropped me down in the rose garden because I, I could run fast and I could jump high and I could entertain them in my little clown suit. Okay? Because I was an athlete. And so they plucked me up, they took me over to the Rose Guard, they dropped me down in the, in the Rose Guard. I said, there you go, Rose, don't you feel so much better now? And low-key I did, because now I was in the Rose Guard. And it didn't take long before I realized that I was a rose of a different color. I came from a different place. I talked differently. I walked differently. I acted differently. My parents were different. My experiences were different than all these kids I was in school with. And I flunked all my classes. And I was ready to leave. College wasn't for me. Okay. I got hurt. First practice, tore all the ligaments in my ankle. Okay. It was a wrap. And that was really the only, only reason I was there. That was my identity. Was, and it was not as an, an intellectual or an academic. It was as an athlete. And once that was taken from me, what's the point? So I had a teacher, a brother named Harry Edwards, who basically told me what I'm going to tell you today. Okay. And it changed my life. I'm going to keep it 100 with you. When I, I was 18 years old, and I walked out of that conversation with this brother. I didn't even know him. Okay? He, just, he just stepped. He had heard about what was going on with me, asked to see me. World famous professor. Look the brother up, Harry Edwards. Okay? You'll see him all over the place. Okay? And he, he just sat me down. He talked to me, broke, broke what I'm going to break down for you today. Okay? Broke it down for me. And when I walked out, I cried. And where I come from, you don't cry. Okay. And I cried because it was the first time in my life that somebody had told me the truth. And so what I'm going to share with you today is the most profound lesson I had given to me when I was right around your age. And then you can take this and carry it where you carry it. Now I'm going to start by breaking down Pac a little bit more because um, this message is so clearly connected to what Pac has to say to us in his work. And no matter where you come down on Pac, right? Cornel West says, no one free of spot or wrinkle. And what he means is, is that no one is above critique. So I think Pac deserves to be critiqued. Pac deserves to be critiqued for the ways in which he promoted violence, the ways in which he promoted misogyny, the ways in which he promoted consumerism at times. But there's something about Pac's message that seems to resonate across so many young people's lives. And, and as my bio said, I can't stand this damn table. I gotta move it. I feel like I'm gonna run into it. Um, like my bio said, um, I lecture all over the world. Okay. And, and one of those places, as I said um, earlier, is, is New Zealand. Okay, and if you look on a map, New Zealand is about as far away from East Oakland as you can get. Literally, the other side of the world. And ten years ago, I, I flew to New Zealand. I was going to work with some Maori youth. The Maori are the indigenous people of New Zealand. I was going to work with some Maori youth in, in New Zealand. It was like 50 young people, about your age. And we're getting ready to start the conversation. This one young brother raises his hand. He goes, you're from Oakland? I'm like, yeah. He said, did you know Tupac? And I'm like, nah, dude, not everybody in Oakland knows each other like that. But it struck me right, that I was all the way across the world. And the first question out of a young person's mouth is, do you know Tupac? There's something about, they just resurrected Pac. 
You heard about this? They put, just did a concert with Pac. Yeah. Uh, it, what was it called? A, uh, 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 a what? All yeah, and all that. Yeah, okay, like you said. <laughs> I'm like, dude, dude's been dead since 96. Right? You can't find anybody, anybody in late modernity okay. that has had the power to reach and teach as Pac. Okay. And I, I, I'm, I know I'm on the East Coast, so this might be a little stretch in Pac is sometimes seen as the West Coast cat, but I'm just curious, how many of y'all young people in here, on your iPhone, your MP3, whatever you, wherever you carry your bangers, hey, have Pac on your... He said, I got Pac and Biggie, me too, bro. Right. And this is so deep to me, right, because... Pot, pot crosses all the lines that school says they want to cross. Race, class, gender, geography. So as a scholar and as a teacher, I want to understand what is it about Pot where he can reach me and he can reach young people all over the world still. Now, we're going to start with a little history lesson about Pot Because while pretty much everybody in here knows Pot, knows who he is, right? Most of you don't know much about Pac, except what MTV has fed you. Okay. So let's break down Pac a little bit. Okay. Tupac was named after Tupac Amaru. And Tupac Amaru was the last Incan king. Right. And when the Portuguese and the Spanish came to colonize the Incans, okay. and my people, the Mexica and the Mayan, when they came, they, they didn't know what to do with this fool. Because he was so powerful. And so they became so threatened by him, right, that they brought him to the town square, right, the Zocolo. They brought him to the center, and they tortured him. And they tortured him in front of all the people to show that they had the power. And... Tupac's last words before they killed him are right there. Okay. No hatred. No get back. Okay. Speak to the earth. Speak to the place that we all come from. Okay. Bear witness right. to this life that's being taken and being sent back to you. Now, the colonialists feel like I'm in prison. <laughs> the and, and, and hey y'all, next time right, somebody from the town comes out here, could you please like send a note that we can't wear hats? Because okay, I don't even know, right? I'm a, long hair, don't care. <laughs> so, um, in Peru in 1589, there was a, um, a conqueror, a conquistador, right, who wrote the following in his will. And this was uh, the, like the preamble to his will. And this is what um, he said, y'all know what a will is? Last will and testament? Okay. So, he said, we found these kingdoms in such good order, and the said Incas governed them in such wise manner that through them there was not a thief Throughout them there was not a thief, nor a vicious man, nor an adulteress, nor was a bad woman admitted among them, nor were there immoral people. And this is the conqueror saying this. He goes on to say, the motive which obliges me to make this statement is the discharge of my conscience, as I find myself guilty. For we have destroyed by our evil example. They were so free from the committal of crimes or excesses as well, men as women, that the Indian who had 100,000 vessels worth of gold or silver in his house left it open, merely placing a small stick against the door as a sign that its master was out. With that, according to their custom, no one could enter or take anything that was there. There was no crime. Okay, you all understand what I'm trying to tell you. These conditions that we're living in right now, they're not natural. They're not part of our history. This is not who we come from. These are conditions that have been taught to us. Right? Which means what? 
They can be untaught. They can be unlearned. This is not the natural state of things. He ends by saying, when they saw that we put locks and keys on our doors, they found that we had thieves among us. And men who sought to make their daughters commit sin, they despised us. What I want you to register for, is, for a second is that we didn't even have locks here. Chip on that. I'm from East Oakland. I can't imagine a situation where I don't lock my house. But now I can. This is why Malcolm X said of all the forms of study, the one that is most likely to reward your efforts is the study of history. Because if you study history, you will see that what we're dealing with right now is not historical. It hasn't always been this way. And if it hasn't always been this way, it doesn't need to be this way. Now, that's who Pot comes from. That's who Pot is named after. Now, as I started thinking more about Pot, I also started thinking about the conflicts I had in school. And the biggest conflict I had in school was the way that school defines success. So, if you are wealthy and you grew up in this country, success is defined by how closely you can return to your community. Okay? The more closely you replicate the life you had growing up, the more successful you are. Cordell West refers to this as a Peter Pan mentality. What was Peter Pan's goal in life? Okay? To be a kid, right? Literally, to stay young forever. And in this country, success is defined by how childish you can act. Paris Hilton. <laughs> Classic example. Or uh, Jackass. I mean, just trip on that, right? You can make millions of dollars by being a ass in this country. It's, it's, it's Disneylandish. Right? Disneyland brags about the fact that nobody's ever died in their premises. Okay? Somebody probably has it, just push them across the line and keep their record clean. <laughs> so, 